Well, if you'd like to follow along, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses uh, 12 through 17, just raise your hand. One of the ushers will come by and bring you a, a Bible there. By way of review, let's just go over some stuff here. Uh, hopefully you've been going to this uh, website, Handfuls Dropped on Purpose, and uh, you can uh, look it up online. Just Google that name right there or take down this website address and go through the various uh, Bible studies. But the one I want you to be most important about uh, to be looking at is deciphering the code. And so we're getting into a little bit more uh, code cracking here this morning. Uh, but also it has some other Bible studies that I'll be referring to uh, today. Uh, I figure uh, you guys have plenty of time at home. You, got, you can go online, you can look at the website and go to these various Bible studies that I'll be referring to even this, this morning. Uh, but let's just go through. Again, uh, here we have uh, the area of the seven churches. Uh, you can look around there at the Mediterranean. You can see how they take off from Israel. They go up and they go across. And that's Asia Minor or modern Turkey to this day where these seven churches are. Um, we've already gone through Ephesus and Smyrna. Uh, Pergamus is 50 miles to the north of uh, Smyrna. And uh, again, you'll see that on the Mediterranean there as well. Gives you another little view here, trying out some new maps and colors and things like that, and readjusted some uh, the projection unit here. So let me know, again, help me out with uh, if you can see these slides or not and the various colors and stuff. Um, and again, these maps are simply in the back of most of your Bibles there that you can uh, follow along with. Uh, you can see these maps as well. Uh, again, look at the, uh, again, by Ray Review, we've already gone through Ephesus, and we're looking at the various years. We're going to see how this also spans, because the, the church age, or the, again, the book of Revelation, as I like to call it, the sequel to the book of Acts, because there is no ending in the book of Acts. Uh, and so we can continue on, and, and we can see all the way through church history. So we see in Ephesus, uh, we've gone through, and Smyrna, which we discussed a couple weeks ago. And these are the rough estimates of, the, of that church age and that timeline as we're going through there. Pergamos, from 312 to 1054 A.D., uh, Church of Pergamos. And so this is church history. Again, this is, these are literal churches uh, that, uh, that the Lord was speaking to, to uh, John uh, the Apostle. Uh, Thyatira, which we'll get to next week, 12 A.D. to present. And again, we're going to see some things on with that. Sardis, 1290 A.D. to present time. We're going to see some of these church ages uh, overlap. But they have very uh, unique characteristics. Uh, and as we go through the seven churches, I also, again, take your notes. Uh, but there's... Uh, uh, sometimes people come up to me and they say, well, d you know, did you mention this or you should have mentioned this or did you, did you know about that? That's, that's true. And my response is, is that I know a lot of things. Uh, this third or fourth time I've gone through the book of Revelation that I'm teaching it, studied it many a times. But uh, did, you, did you hear anything new today? Did you, did anything else w was, was brought up? Because if you already know that and I say that again, then it's redundant for you, isn't it? And so when we get to the end of the seven churches, uh, I'm going to go through a, a, a study of who wrote the Bible. And we're going to be able to take a lot of things, and you just, I, I'm already freaked out by it. Uh, I'm blessed by it, I should say. Uh, just, uh, just the signature. Every time I go through the, uh, the book of Revelation, which, I mean, it's the only letter in the Bible that says you get blessed for reading it. I mean, that's pretty presumptuous, don't you think? Uh, but you do. You get you get blessed for reading it. Not that you have to understand everything, but that you get blessed every time. And I do more and more and more. And so there's more and more stuff that have, that have come out over the years. And uh, so when we get through the seven churches, that will be uh, a pretty good study to, uh, again, that you might want to invite family and friends to that one as well. Uh, learning that uh, the phrase, that again, the kingdom of heaven is a direct terminology of, uh, regarding life in Christ here on earth. The kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we also know, also know about the kingdom of God and, and the kingdom here on earth. The seven letters to seven churches uh, actually represent seven periods of church history. We know that now. They didn't know that when this was given to them. But yet, through the various church ages, and you read uh, various uh, 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 stories and accounts of, of those who, have uh, uh, again, leave us a history, and you can see these things in these church ages, again, uh, through the book of Revelation. It's here we realize that Revelation, again, is chapters 2 and 3 is a sequel to the book of Acts. Um, 
We can see the state of each of these seven churches. And we can see the own, of our own walk. So again, these are literal seven churches. Uh, these are little, I believe, seven uh, different church ages. And also, we can look at it in our own lives and our walks with the Lord. So let's just take a little glimpse right here. Where do we go already? We, Ephesus. Remember that whole thing about Ephesus as we go in. Uh, again, for yours and I's life individually. So again, we look at the Word of God. How about when we discovered Ephesus about that first love? No, they didn't lose their first love. They left their first love. And any of you have walked with the Lord for any amount of time, has it ever gotten dry? Has it ever just gotten, I don't want to say boring, but has it ever got dry or cold or whatever? And that's that whole thing is that, no, you didn't lose, but you left your first love. We can also see this in, not just in our own walks, but we can also see this, uh, again, these seven churches applying to uh, the, the life of a church. There's things that, that we go through, I and mean, I've seen, I've been pastoring this church for 18 years, and I can see various things as well. There's, there's times as a, as a fellowship, maybe we've gone cold or stale, or we've compromised, or we've mixed some things in, and we've got to, again, get pure again, and we have to root some things out that it just comes in. We need to dig even deeper and deeper. And again, if you want to do your own exercise there, go through Matthew chapter 13 and do the, the seven kingdom parables. They line up with also the seven churches. Um, Jesus writes his first letter to the city called Ephesus. Again, it means in the Greek, it means desirable. Uh, and again, it's one of affection and longing. Like a, uh, and that's that whole thing. Uh, when you first come to Christ, I mean, for, for me, when I first came to Christ, I'm just grateful that God had forgiven me of all my sins. And months and months later, I, I, I backslid and, and walked away from the Lord. Probably would have only backslid for about a month, but pride keeps you away for a few more months. And uh, you just don't want to admit, oh, and you want to face it. And then when I show up, finally show up with all the Christians again, show up to church, and I, and I had all this perception about everything that's going to happen. All I heard was, oh, you're here now. Oh, you went through that. But you see, here's the other thing. When I first came to Christ, I was just grateful that God was going to forgive me of everything. But when I backslid, now I know when coming back to Christ that I'm going to have to be accountable for a lot of those things I did when I was backslidden there. Again, so that's desirable there. So I left that first love. And again, through Ephesus, what were those first works? Returning to those first works and, and that spending time in the Word. You know, uh, prayer, the Word, and fellowship. Now, prayer is usually the last thing to go. Crazy guy walking down the street. You know, I mean, that might be the last thing to go is, is prayer. And, 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 but, you, you know, you give up on the Word of God, and you're going to stop hanging around people who are quoting the Word of God. You just, why hang around them? And if, and if you stop hanging around people who, who are into the Word of God, then you'll stop reading the Word of God. So it's that iron sharpens iron from what the Word of God tells us. And there's, when it happens with that, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's some sparks. And so there's a lot of sparky people here, man. You understand that? I'm one of them. I cause a lot of sparks. And so we get those whole thing that we used to pray. We used to do those things. Remember the joy that we came together as, as Christians. And just remember talking about uh, street witnessing or, or just going out and sharing our faith with others and, and telling them about Jesus. So remembering those first works. You never get old for that. You never get tired of that. And so, again, Smyrna, 64 to uh, 311 A.D. Uh, Smyrna is derived from the perfume myrt. Uh, it, it means persecuted or, or, or crushed. And that's that hole where you get that fragrant aroma from that myrrh that it has to be crushed. You crush those petals and this ooey, ooey, sticky, oozy gum comes out, but it's this, this, this sweet fragrance and stuff. It was also used as medicine. But we also know that with the church, that there's persecution. So you remember, when you've come to Christ and you're walking with the Lord, and First Timothy is right, for all those who seek to live a godly life, not maybe, not sort of, not a little bit there, but those who seek to live a godly life, shall be persecuted. And so we can see that in our own walks. And we can see that even in our own church. Early Christians joyfully accepted the plundering of their goods. You can go back and you can read Hebrews 10, uh, 34. And, and the writer of Hebrews is even telling us, and even here in, in Smyrna, the Lord's telling us, don't you remember what it was like when you willingly gave up all those things? I watched a guy who... Uh, who came to the Lord. He was a very wealthy businessman, and, and uh, he just had a lot of money, and he knew that he wasn't going to take any of it with him, and so he used to just give it away. When he'd see ministry going on, or he'd see those things, or someone in need, man, he'd just give it. But I watched him over the years from him pulling out wads of hundreds to maybe 50s, and then down to maybe just a few uh, bucks if he would, he would do that, you know, because now he's got to start storing up for the future, and I watched his business just go down the tubes. 
I've watched people who've, again, they've grown, they've seen a little bit of persecution, they've been desirable, they've backslid, they've come back to the Lord, and we even see economics. A a, a story of a a, a guy, I like to see this painting one day, some artist wants to do that, but uh, it's this vision of, you know, you see the the man or woman of Christ in in, in the armor of God, right? See this man of God, and the armor of God's got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the truth, feet prepared and shod with the gospel there, loins girded up, everything. And the devil just kept trying to attack him, attack him, attack him. Finally got to him. He went behind him and kicked the guy in the wallet and he fell apart. You see, there's nothing covering that backside there. And if that's where your whole hope and your treasure is, and that's why the word of God tells us where your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Not where your heart is. Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure, folks? And so here, even today, it's a common form of persecution against Christians economically holding some things up. As I shared with you last week or a couple weeks ago about the Coptic church, the uh, Christians in Egypt and the persecution that they're going through, they, they've designed their own economy. They're recycling trash. No, they're already considered the off-scouring or the refuse of society. So the pastor there, and, and they've gotten together with a lot of the other Christians there, and, and they go to the dumps and they recycle people's trash that no one wants to touch, and, and now they have an income. They have money. They're able to provide for one another and do those things. And so for us today, Pergamos 312 to 1054 A.D. Now, again, this is the third letter to the city, again, of Pergamos. <clears throat> the name Pergamos means of much marriage. Or more precisely, <coughs> excuse me, second marriage. And so again, we have desirable in Ephesus. We have persecuted or crushed in Smyrna. And now we have much marriage or second marriage. There's an implication here. These names aren't just, uh, you know, by happen chance. They denote a beginning marriage with Jesus, but another source of marital union. That's what's being signified here. It paints the the beginning of the historic religion that would mix both Christianity and pagan ritual. Now again, when this was being written, when John's getting this revelation, when this is going on, he doesn't totally understand it. That's why I'm saying it's okay. You need to get blessed and you read God's word, but John, who was even getting the revelation and and was given the word of God to us, didn't quite understand it. This is total out of his realm. We can look back on history now and we can see the things that fit. That's the whole beautiful thing about prophecy. When it's foretold, and then when it comes to pass, you can go, oh, wow, look at that. That's why many people think that the Bible was written after the fact, was written after all these things, but that just isn't true. And so they, because that's just too much pinpoint accuracy when it comes on to those things here. And so what both mixes Christianity and, and pagan ritual? Well, we're going to go on here. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, Pergamos was, was the political capital of the Roman province of Asia. They were, again, uh, there was a capital in this region for 300 years. For 300 years. So there's some things that are going on there. The city was another city for culture. It had a huge library. For those of you who are going with us on Israel tour and to Egypt, we're going to go to, we're going to, go to uh, Alexandria, and we're going to see uh, what is really the largest library in the world of antiquities and stuff. But, but that... Pergamus was that one of that, of that day. 200,000 volumes. And you have to understand what Alexander the Great would do that before the Romans. Alexander the Great, what he would do is he would go in and he'd conquer a nation and he would take all their literature, take all their information to build these huge libraries so he could understand those that he's conquered. And so this is that Pergamus there. Pergamus was also an extremely religious city. A lot of competition for religion. Remember, Smyrna had, the, again, the first temple of, uh, again, this Roman worship here. But they had the temples to the Greek and the Roman gods, Dionysus, Athena, Demetria, and Zeus. It was also here that the temples dedicated the worship of the Roman emperor. Remember how it started off? Well, let's just venerate. Let's just say the whole spirit of, of Rome. And then let's start worshiping the dead emperors. And then let's start, you know, paying veneration and, and worship to the, to the live emperors. And, and then... Now we're just going to take the emperor and it's going to be Caesar worship and he's going to be as God. Some 50 years before Smyrna won the honor of building the first temple to Tiberius, the city of Pergamos won the right to build the first temple to worship Caesar Augustus in the Roman province of Asia. These are the things, folks. A lot of competition for religion when you're competing for your gods and all kinds of things like that. And so these folks here, very religious, very spiritual, 
It was specially known as the center for worship of the deity known as Asaculopolis, or I don't know, it's that, it's that snake on the serpent pole, the serpent on the, on the pole that it goes all the way back to Moses, but it goes back even further than that. <clears throat> there was a great medical school there, also a school of psychology, and that, don't get me going on that. But it, again, it's a representation of this serpent, God healing and, and, and knowledge. There was a medical school there, as I said, and because of the most famous temple to the Roman God of healing, the sick and the disease would come there. <clears throat> Uh, they would come to there and they would think, but let's look at some of the stuff that they would do. Sufferers were allowed to spend the night in the darkness of the temple. In the temple, there were tame snakes in the night. Uh, the sufferer might be touched by one of these tame and harmless snakes as it glided over the ground on which he lay. The touch of the snake was held to be the touch of, of the God himself, and the touch was held to bring health and healing. Barclay quotes that. How'd you like that, huh? Hey, what do I need? I just got to go to the temple and get touched by a snake, and uh, I'll be healed. This is that form of worship. This is, <clears throat> again, what the Christians are going through there, and they're going to stand up against that. <clears throat> Dan, you got one of your things there? Sometimes I just give it all out during worship there, so I got nothing left there. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, I got to unwrap it? Yeah. Man. Got to do everything around here. <laughs> Verse 12, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Verse 12. And again, every, we go back to Revelation 1, 16 and to 17 and 18, and there's an identification that Jesus makes of himself, and he's going to give this identification individually to each churches. And so this one, he brings out the sharp two-edged sword. Uh, the sharp two-edged sword, again, as we see back in verse 116, uh, it's going to come out of his mouth here. And that this two-edged sword, the Christians in Pergamos are going to get it. They're going to be confronted by the word of God. The description of the sword is a revelation, again, when it helps us associate it. They're going to feel the sharp two-edged sword. Remember what Hebrews 4.12 tells us, that the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword, able to divide between bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions, the attitudes of the heart. I mean, that's how sharp it is. They're going, they're going to feel it. Remember, Jesus will have something to say to them. Verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. How'd you like that for a sign over your house? And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, uh, you where Satan dwells. So, is that really where Satan dwells? Remember that Satan can only be in one place at one time. We know that he goes before the throne of God, and he, and he brings, and he's known as the accuser of the brethren and the sister. And he, again, continually brings accusations to the Lord about us. Jesus said to each church, it's a true, uh, and it's true of each of us, he knows our works, even if there isn't much to know, you'd think. He knows our works. Great, big, small, little, whatever they are. Uh, he knows these things. Remember, as we go through this, Jesus holds us. That's the other thing about he holds the stars. He holds the churches. He holds you and I in his hand. Uh, I just get incredulous when people say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm jumping out of the hand of God. The earth's his footstool. Have you watched the Summer Olympics? I think seven, eight feet, maybe at best, is the highest anyone can really jump. <clears throat> you really think you can get out of the hand of God? You just, you know. Holds you up right there. I think of Shirley MacLaine and her writing on a, her book, Out on a Broken Limb, or whatever it's called, and how she stands on the shores. This is how I grew up, by the way, folks. She'd stand on the shores there in Malibu and yell out, I am God! I am God! I am God! And can you imagine God in heaven? <clears throat> just strolling, looking around. And he just, and he just hears it. He goes, hey, Gabriel. Michael, come on, come on over here. What is that little grain of sand saying? I am God! <laughs> well, go figure there. He knows our works. He knows each and every one of us intimately. We'll continue on here. What does it mean that, he, that, uh, that they lived where Satan's throne is? In many ways, Pergamos was a, a stronghold of Satan. 
of satanic power. Oh, I mean, there are temples there, there are altars there, uh, much pagan worship uh, in all the places there. So again, it was a demonic stronghold, as we could see there. Uh, and you hold fast to my name, despite the fact that they lived in such a difficult city. If you're taking notes, folks, because they lived in difficult cities, the Christians of Pergamos hold fast to their faith. They hold fast to his name, and they do not deny him. These are some good things here. And so they're in the midst of all this paganism. Remember, in any one of the temples, not that you just go to the one in Pergamos for, for healing, but every one of them dealt with immorality. Every one of them was some type of sexual act. So you would go to the temple and you would have sex with the, with the temple prostitute. Male, female, boy, girl, whatever. And even the animals and the bestiality. That's how you worship. That's how you would express yourselves to your God and what you would have to do for them. And that they did not deny their faith. So here in our day and age, here in uh, Minnesota, uh, there could, people, they claim to be Christians. And it's hard, you know, there's a lot of mixing going on. How do you know? I remember going to a, a wedding. It was a mixed marriage, Catholic and Lutheran. Uh, and there was a lot of religion that was going on there. And so here's the thing. But you did not deny my faith. They are really going to stick out. And I don't know if we can really get in that mindset or <clears throat> if you've ever seen that, but Christians are really going to stick out. We know the ones in Smyrna were being persecuted and they were being uh, <clears throat> economically uh, withheld from jobs and, and money and everything that could happen that could give them a life of prosperity. In Smyrna, everyone was prospering, but again, the Christians here. So they did not deny their faith. It's always important to make sure, listen to this, it's always important to make sure that the faith we hold on to is the faith that belongs to Jesus. Not faith in faith. I've got faith. In what? I've got faith. In what? You know, it's one of the things, and, and uh, uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and, and Narcotics Anonymous and, and those for who talk a lot on and on and on, uh, all of them have these things about a higher power, and anything can be your higher power. And, you know, I've gotten sober through uh, AA, and there's been all those groups and stuff like that. Yeah, I like to get sober to the point to where you can truly understand the way, but th to have a faith in faith, what is the outcome of your faith? The outcome of my faith in this podium is that it'll hold things up. The outcome of your faith in these chairs is that they don't collapse on you. Do you understand? What is the outcome of your faith in a doorknob? What is the outcome of your faith if you're higher power? What is our outcome of our faith in Jesus Christ is eternal life. It's that blessed hope. And it's that peace that goes by all understanding. Talking with a uh, Christian here today. How do, how do people do it when they go through the separations? You know, when you think of the military that, that the, the troops put uh, and provide for us. And they're gone. And, and we, we see here in Minnesota, and the Minnesota, the National Guard, is one of the most heavily deployed units in the nation. And, and in the separation, how do they do it without the Lord? Well, I was in the military, and they don't do it well. If you don't have, I mean, the ones who do have the Lord, it's hard for them on their own. But the ones who don't have the Lord, how, how do they go through all that? And it's just, it's, it's, it's just horrible. So you've got to have a faith. You've got to have a faith but a faith that belongs to Jesus Christ. And so here, Antipas was my faithful martyr. John speaks of him and doesn't give us a whole lot of description of him, but he is pretty well known. And he knows about it. So this has also given us a timeline of when this is happening. Place Who was killed among you? Uh, one specific man among the Christians, Pergamos, received a precious little title, faithful martyr. Uh, the same title is held by Jesus in Revelation 1.5. Antipas was a man who followed Jesus, who was like, and who was like Jesus. And we're going to see some things here. It is much, it is much no ex, uh, uh, ecclesiastical history makes mention of this martyr Antipas, which argues him to have been a person, but of obscure note in the world. But Christ seeth and taketh notice of those little ones who belong to him, uh, though the world uh, overlooks them. Commentary by Poole. World might overlook you. You might be insignificant uh, according to the world schemes, but Jesus Christ knows our works. He knows us intimately. He knows everything about us. And here Antipas is talked about here. Uh, Antipas lived, uh, lived where Satan's throne was. He was martyred. Yet he stood against the attacks and the evil around him. He fulfilled the meaning of his name because his name Antipas means against all. I mean, you're pretty much pegged if that's your name. 
Now, whether that's the name that was given to him or that he took once he became a Christian, but this is what he was known, of, known as, and it's against all. And against all. And so that's one way. You know, that's why, you know, when people, I, I, I like the word uh, or the name Joy. You know, I used to work with this one person named Joy, and she just did not live up to her name. <laughs> you know, you're one of the seven jurors. You're grumpy. You're grumpy. You know, you got to change your name. Stop it. You're teasing me. I know. Live up to your name. W- would you? You know, and so, do you know your name's in the Bible? Uh, this I digress. Against all. Traditionally, the Roman governor said Antipas as they were bringing him up, as they were about to execute him. Do you not realize the whole world is against you? To which he answered. Now, now think about this, folks. I mean, before I give his answer here, his name means against all. You stick out as a Christian. And, and as a Christian, you will be persecuted and you will be mocked and you will be ridiculed. Jesus even said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. He says, and do not think of surprise. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're to rejoice in these things. And in Pergamos, you definitely stick out. I mean, just with the, the, the religious and the pagan worship and all this thing that's going on, you definitely stick out. And it's not going to, I mean, you do differently. You your work differently. Your business practices are different than the things in the world. You don't go along with the status quo. Everything about you to the point where people will ask you, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this way? And so much so that I guess the conviction or whatever, they bring him and it brings him certain death. He says, don't you know that the whole world is against you? His answer, that Antipas is against the whole world. Antipas is against the whole world. I'm against these things. When people would say, you know, hey, uh, chick, known to uh, consume an adult beverage in my youth, uh, and hey, let's go out drinking, and I become a Christian. Let's go out drinking, and I'd say, no, I don't have to anymore. What do you mean? Have to. Not like, oh, no, I'm trying to cut back. Uh, no, I'm not, not tonight. But I made a point to make it a purposeful statement. Nothing, <coughs> nothing happens a whole lot with me by random. I just, I purpose in my heart to make this. I said, no, I don't have to do that anymore. And they're like, uh, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you do. But I don't have to anymore. You know, drinking was a symptom. Drinking was never the issue in my life, even though I was a drunk. Uh, some would say an alcoholic, but I'm telling you, it's not a disease. I chose to do that. But... Uh, so the thing is, is that I said, no, I don't have to do it anymore. I, I've got peace that goes by all understanding. But you have to do that. You have no hope. I, I don't. <laughs> Someone just simply asked me. Now, the world simply asked me. They weren't trying to be mean. That was just the way the world is. Hey, let's go out drinking tonight. Nope, don't have to. Uh, well, I don't have to. Well, try not to. But I don't want to. I mean, I used to say it. I can quit drinking any time, man. I, I, I've done it a hundred times. I do not have to drink. And No, you, you have to, because you have no hope. And so here, Antipas is against the whole world. If the world's against you, then I'm against the whole world. In classical Greek, martyrs never means a martyr in our sense of the term. It always means a witness. A martyr uh, one, uh, was one who said, this is true, and I know it. It's not until New Testament times that martyrs ever means martyr, Barclay's commentary. You understand that? It, we think, oh, sometimes you say, oh, I'm just being a martyr here. Oh, that, and being persecuted and stuff like that. But the word martyr or martyrus in Greek means that this is true. This is so true that I'm going to die for it or I'm going to be persecuted for it. I know this is true. I know what it is and I'm a witness. And that's what Antipas was. He was a witness to the truth. And that's how Christianity spreads, even to this day, folks. The personal witness, martyrdom if, you, if it be, uh, but martyrs, the, that I know this is true. The personal witness of every believer who witnesses this and shares it. So it isn't just going out witnessing, and I'm sharing my faith there, but you are a witness. You are an example. Good or bad, you're an example of something. You might be... The only Bible someone ever reads. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but you might be the only book someone reads. Are you the Bible or the satanic verses? Uh, and if you let, and I say, look, do all that you can 
to preach the gospel. Whatever you have, by whatever means, do whatever you can to preach the gospel. And if that, if last resort, and if it's absolutely necessary, use words. This is Antipas' life. He was different. And history tells us these things. And it lets us know of them. In 312 AD, the Emperor Constantine ended the mass persecution of Christians. So now for 300 years, Christianity, you, it means certain death. It's where they hid in the catacombs. It, uh, they really had secret signs. You might see the little fish on some people's uh, cars and letting them know their cars are saved or something. Uh, you see the little ichthys symbol as it is, and the I-O-X-O-I-E uh, in, the, in the fish. The, we call it the ichthys, whatever. And it, and it means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Uh, those are the first letters of, of each uh, word that says those things. And that, that's that whole symbolism. But it would get to the point where you would meet another person and you would kind of sense they're a Christian and then you would maybe draw half that fish symbol in you, on the dirt or something like that and they would finish it over. Or you would uh, put your sandals in such a way at your door and it, would, it, would, it was just insider lingo. The Christians would know who the Christians were and they could fellowship with one another and they're being persecuted. And the personal witness and the body of Christ and the church of Jesus Christ is growing and growing and growing because it is said that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So Satan tries another plan now. Persecution's not working. It's not stopping it. So let's do something else, and this is where we get to this. Much marriage or second marriage entwined here. Instead of the opening, uh, and again, instead of opening and the canonizing of Scripture, the Bible for all to read, Constantine closes it and he, and he does this whole Nicene Creed. He gets this whole council together. He starts getting all these other bishops. Now remember, there's an east and a west. It wasn't the Roman Empire as we know it today. But there was an east and a west, and they're fighting, fighting with a constant, constant uh, whatever, you know, they're in Turkey. Very good, excellent. All right. And so he's fighting with them. So here they are in the east and the west, and, and, and they're trying to, they're fighting there. And so what's happening is, is now Constantine is having a, a, a battle. We'll get on here in a little bit here. Uh, there's a shift in theology when this comes on as well. Because up until this time, what are they waiting for? The blessed hope. I want to give you the roots again where it comes back to where people give up on the whole blessed hope. That they believe that the kingdom of heaven is now. So he gets all these bishops. He gets all these. You can come out of the catacombs. It, it, Christianity is now in vogue. Because supposedly the world will tell you, history will tell you, that Constantine became a Christian. And he Christianized the nation. And uh, he made all of his Roman soldiers go through a water, and he sprinkled them with water and said, you're all baptized right now. One day you're, you're a pagan, now you're all a Christian. And that's, that's how it happened. And he sealed up the scriptures, and he said, now we've got to have others who will, uh, who will interpret the word, or not anyone even call it the word of God, that's insider lingo, there, but it, the Bible there. They had the word of God, but he started to get to all these things, and there was a shift in theology. Those who departed from its dictates were regarded as heretics. You and I would be considered heretics. You and I, because we believe in the God's word. And so he sealed it up. In the West, Rome was being established as the throne of the Christian church. It was being established as a throne here. And so there was a, there was a fight going on. In the East, which we get the Greek and the Russian and the European Orthodox. What happened is, is Constantine has this battle with Maximus. And there's this power struggle. And what they start to do is, is Constantine sets up, and he gets this uh, bishop from Haifa, from Israel. Gets him from all over the lands, all over the Roman Empire there, and he gets him. And this one starts to, uh, has this brand of Christianity that intermingles uh, Babylonian pagan worship. Has this hodgepodge of, of, of Christianity, but he intermingles it. He makes him the pontiff. It's later where we're going to get uh, uh, the pope. But he makes him the, the high prefect, the high pontiff of the land there. And, and Constantine sets up a, a basilica there in Rome, and he wants to be buried in the center, in his uh, uh, sarcophagus there. He wants to be buried in the center, and he wants all the bodies of all the 12 apostles around him. So there's a great rush for relics. We've got to find relics. We've got to find relics. Now, the Romans have the apostle James's body, but uh, the, uh, the Eastern, or the Greek, Russian, Orthodox, European, they have the head of James. 
And, and a few years ago, there was this reconciliation between the East and the West, and the East gave the head back and said, you can put James back together in this whole unification. That was just a, probably about a decade ago, about 10 years ago. You can go online and, and Google it. There's all this relic hunting, and everyone was into this relic because, again, it mixes this whole superstition. It gets away from the Word of God that, you know, there's going to be a bodily resurrection someday, that God puts it all together. Uh, so here, there's this great influence and power, and he starts to get, and that's what all these little pontiffs, all these little popes with two O's, all these ones running around <laughs> are trying to, to gather together their influence. They had their own armies. There was many popes. It wasn't just this one pope, but there was many popes who had all their various armies around them, and there was a lot of war going on. To win scores of converts amongst the idol-worshipping Romans, uh, rural, the Greeks' deities were replaced by images of saints and apostles. This is where we get the whole veneration of the saints and stuff. Uh, and so they just said, hey, one day you're a pagan worshiping heathen, now you're a Christian, and they replaced it again with all these things. Then there's all sprinkling of water over the crowds, and the people became, you know, you're all Christians now. That's how, in 312 A.D., Constantine did. His mother, Helena, never really confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. She was a sun-worshipping heathen pagan. She goes back to Israel, and she tries to find all the locations that, again, there's Catholic churches and uh, Eastern and Orthodox as well, uh, of all the various sites that she believes that uh, tradition says, well, this is where Jesus was born. That's why in Bethlehem you have the Church of the Nativity, a little marble slab over the actual birthplace of, of Jesus. You have all these churches and all these monasteries and all these things built because she says, well, from tradition, it was here, it was here, and here. And again, they get into this whole superstition thing that's going on there. So there's this battle with Maximus, the east and the west, and they're trying to gain power. Now, now, Constantine saw a flaming cross in the sky. He says, under this cross, conquer, and you will be victorious there. I'm not even going to try to repeat it in Latin to you. I tried practicing, practicing last night. It's just not going to happen, all right? <laughs> hocus, pocus, adonami, whatever. Uh, the battle with Maximus there in the east. And, and, and here's the problem that's going on is, is the, there's a shift in theology now. What's happening is, is that they're saying, okay, the, the Christians at that time saying, okay, well, look, we're trying to interpret. I want you to understand, they're trying to interpret the Bible. And this is all new to them. John's not even totally understanding all these things. But here's how it happened, folks. They said, well, you know what? Now the persecution is over. And now, there's this, now it's in vogue to be a Christian. Now there's no persecution. Christians have gone from hiding in the catacombs now to being elevated into the whole Roman Empire, and it's in vogue now to be a Christian. Now with that, a shift in theology happened. There's no longer looking for the blessed hope and the return of the Lord. Now it's the kingdom is on, on earth. The kingdom of God is on earth now. And why not benefit from all the things? And they, believe, they believed that they were in the millennium, that 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. Well, then they got to get into ushering back Christ to the earth because they got to do some things. they got to make it a Christian nation and stuff like that. And that's how you get what's called kingdom now or dominion theology, where we're going to usher in. We're going to become a Christian world, and that's when Christ will return. No, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. That's what the Bible says. And it has gotten worse and worse and worse. And so here's the thing. He has this battle. So there's a shift going on. And now the East and the West, they're trying to get as many relics as they can. They're trying to get all the bodies. So basically, uh, uh, the Roman Empire that's in the West there, they get about six of the apostles' bodies. The, the East, you know, they get about ten of the apostles' bodies. You know, everyone gets this, all these relics and stuff. Then it becomes the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Before it was just the Catholic Church. Catholic meaning universal. But then Constantine says, no, it's the Holy Roman. He changes it from the Holy Roman, and that's where the great split happened between the East and the West. And, and I have friends who are in the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox, and they do the sign of the cross differently. Uh, they have a different Easter celebration. I mean, just totally, totally different from the, the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And so here they're into great relics. They're trying to find all these things. They're into idolatry. They're declared Christian. No one ever really makes a profession of faith. And then they believe they're, that they're in the millennium. Well, let's do a little bit of history here. This might freak a little few of you out here. So you think of cross, right? 
Constantine was told, he saw in a vision, under this cross, conquer. What cross did he see? It's called the Ankh. It's a pagan, pagan Egyptian symbol. It goes all the way to Babylon. It exists in the Catholic Church to this day. Now, I don't mean to offend anyone here uh, individually, just as a group. And, uh, <laughs> and stick with me through the rest of the churches of Revelation. We're going to get everybody, including ourselves, all right? But Catholics, it's your turn today. This is that cross. This is an Ankh. You can go Google it online, A-N-K-H. Folks, that's not the cross of Jesus Christ. That's a pagan Egyptian symbol. Under this cross, go and conquer. For those of you who are recovering Catholics, have you ever seen this in any parishes you've been in? Does the vicar, the anti, uh, vicar walk through with these things? That's what's in it. That's the cross. That's all been in as far as the paganism. Again, they've changed the various things. Jesus Christ wasn't born December 25th. That was a pagan holiday of Nimrod, all the way back to Babylon. Uh, these are the things, the same thing with Ishtar. It got turned into Easter. Um, all these pagan holidays. They just from, went from one day saying you're pagans, now we're all Christians, and that's what's going to happen. It becomes in vogue. This is what Constantine had seen, and this is what's even in that organization to this day. Verses 14 and 15, but I have a few things against you. Now again, my faithful witness Antipas, that's a good example for all of us here. No, we can think of that martyr because you're going to die for your faith. But again, understand what a martyr is. It is a witness to the truth that I know this is the truth. So much so, there is no convincing me otherwise. And I will go to my grave and he will have to kill me for that. Because he says here, but I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Remember, it was just the deeds are the Nicolaitans, but now we're going to see some other things here. The doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. This is the thing that's intermingled. Nicolaitan, Nicolaus, it means a conqueror or lord over laitans, laity. This is where this whole laity comes from. You have this uh, liturgy. You have these uh, priests. You have these uh, men who are over the regular peons of society. This is what Constantine started, his Roman Empire. He, this is how he held and kept the word of God as, that would be life and giving to everyone. And says, no, we're going to have the laity now, and they're going to be over the people. And the Christians had gone through the persecution, we're accepting this and believing their shift in theology, now it's the kingdom of heaven now. And these are the things that, that, that he's trying to deal with here through this whole Nicolaitan here. He says, look, I have a few things against you. Christians and Pergamos were rightly praised for holding fast the name of Jesus Christ and keeping the faith, but at the same time, in their difficult environment, there's no excuse for the few things that Jesus had against them. Understand this. There's no excuse for the few things that, again, the compromise that would come in. Again, this whole priesthood that, that got started, that you had to go and you had to listen to a priest and you had to listen to your sins. This all started off. And by the way, you had to buy those indulgences. You have those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam. You'll have to go back to Numbers and, and read what happened with Balaam. Balaam, not a Jew, but was a prophet, and went to Balak and said, Look, I can't curse them. I can't damn them. I can't do that. But I can tell you what. I can tell you how, God can get, how you can get God to get mad at them. Go send your Moabite foxes down there and in, 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 mingle with the guys there. And this took a while. It just wasn't a week. It took a while. And get them to marry. And get them to, and the, those women will pull their hearts away from the Lord. And they'll begin to worship paganism and all these things. And don't worry. God will do a number on him. And, and that's the whole thing. You got involved in that whole pagan. It was an idolatry. He was a prototype of all corrupt teachings. And this is what was going on. This is the same things that you might see with the televangelists, the various other uh, you know, gurus of uh, prosperity teaching, all this stuff, that, that you have to go through them, and you've got to come to them. They're the man or the woman of God. And they'll quote verses like, touch not the Lord's anointed. But I mean, we have God's revealed word here. We have God's revealed word, Numbers 22 and 24 and 31. You also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. In other words, there's laity. There's a, a religious elite that's over them, and you've got to come to them for, <laughs> for understanding. And that's how the word of God was held for almost a thousand years. 
Jesus praised the Ephesian church because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But now the Nicolaitans have also have their doctrine, and some among the Christians held the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's in the church now. What happened with Smyrna? You couldn't be a phony. This couldn't go on in Smyrna with persecution. You're being persecuted for your faith. There, there, that's the whole thing that happens with persecution. It purifies you. you. You have no room for anything else. Well, now the persecution is over. Satan's got his plan. He's going to give him rest. He's going to give him ease. And now it's in vogue to be a Christian. And now we're going to start getting in, intermarried here or in, uh, intermingled. And this is going to be the second marriage. What, if the do, what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? The name Nicolaus, again, the laity, the conquer the people. According to the ancient commentaries, the Nicolaitans also approved of immorality. They could do whatever they wanted. Because then all you had to do is just go to the priest and say, you know, so many hails, Marys, and venerations of the various saints, which the day before they were pagan deity gods. And, and now you're saying, well, no, that's not Zeus. That's the Apostle Peter. That's not, you know, Dionysus. That is, yeah, that's no longer Mercury. That's the Apostle Paul. Remember Paul and and Barnabas, as they traveled through, they, some people thought that Barnabas was Zeus and, and Paul was Mercury, and, and they began to worship, and they start slaughtering a cow, and Paul's saying, hey, I guess we're having a barbecue. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, that's pagan worship. No, we've got to stop here. I'm a man just like you. You have those who, who are there, and then you have those who are also hold to that. What about all this tolerance? The rebuke is also against those in the church who allow them to continue. You have some of those there, and they, that they hold to these things here. Hey, 1 Corinthians, if you're taking notes, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-9. through 9, Paul rebukes the Corinthians because of their tolerance and their acceptance. He says, you have a man in your fellowship who's, you know, incest. He's married his father's wife, his stepmother. And, and you say, oh, look, how tolerant are we? Aren't we? This is great. We're very accepting. No, it's against the word of God. Kick him out. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so his soul may be preserved on the day of judgment. And then in 2 Corinthians, the guy comes back and then the Corinthians, they say, right to Paul, what should we do? He says, bring, if he wants back, if he's repented, bring him back. It's not a you know, forever banishment. Just tell him he gets those things right. You're tolerant of these things. No, you need to be rebuked on those things. So Satan tried to accomplish his goals by using deception. First he used violence, persecution. Now he's using alliance. Verse 16, repent. Five of the seven churches here are, are commanded to repent. Metanoia. It means to make a U-turn on the real life. Do 180 degree turn of what you're doing. You need to repent. Repent is a command that applies to the Christians, not only those who first who come to Jesus. Again, for those who come to, again, not just when you first time you come to him, but continually. You look at the Apostle Paul. 30, 40, 45 years in the ministry, he refers to himself early on as a sinner among sinners. 15, 20 years in the ministry, he refers to himself as the worst among sinners. 2 Timothy he refers to himself as the chief among sinners. See, we have this idea that the more you walk with the Lord, the holier you get. The more that you walk with the, the Lord and the closer you get to the flame, you realize how much is being burned off. It's a continual cleansing process, Christian. Don't, don't get bummed out that you've been walking with the Lord for 1.2 million years and then you read the Word of God and then and God convicts you and the Holy Spirit's right there and you're like, wow, oh Lord, I, I shouldn't be doing that. But I've been doing that for 1.2 million years as a Christian. I, I've been doing this a long time. Hey, you're here now. There was other things that God was cleansing and working and getting out of your life there. But when you hold to the that only a super religious elite can, can have the power of the Word of God or you're involved in all types of immorality and you think that's okay, you're in an alliance, you've compromised. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, the Word of God. When we go to one another for counsel, Romans 14 tells us that if we have a handle on God's Word, we are competent to counsel one another. And it just doesn't mean, tell me how you feel today. That counsel means, that word in the Greek means to take, to actually shake if you have to. You resort to whatever it is that, like, look, by, by, by a firm grasp, not beating them up physically, but just look, get a hold of them, get a hold of your senses here. Here is God's Word. They're going to be rebuked with what? God's Word. Not just how God feels that day, what Jesus tried to tell them, but you're going to be here. Repent, or the Christian 
is that Pergamus will face Jesus with a two-edged sword. Remember the Apostle Paul? He says, hey, how do you want me to come to you? I write these letters. You say he writes many heavy things, but I'm trying to get this done ahead of time. So when I come to you, I just get to love on you. But what do you want when you see me? Do you want Paul in the letters? Or do you want teddy bear Paul when I show up? I, I just want to love you. Yeah, you know, I have rules. I have certain things that my family is going to live. And I've even said the same thing to my own kids. I don't want to come home to a bald wife pulling her hair out, frustrated with you all day long. All right? I like her long hair. But here's my rules I've told my kids. When I come home, if dad can't play, someone's going to pay. My kids know that one. Because I want to come home. I want to come home and I want to play with the kids. I want to have a time. I don't want to be whooping on them. I don't want to be doing that. In the same way, he's giving the, the Christians in Pergamos there. You want the two-edged sword? I'm going to come. And understand this. If you're taking notes here, it's your choice. It's your choice. To be obedient to God's word and to follow after that. That two-edged sword, and again, it begins in the house of God, folks. When Jesus comes, he will confront them with his word. Verse 17, the first part, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear. The danger of false teaching and immoral conduct still faces the church to this day. You can, you can see it and stuff. I, I, again, watching the, some of the, the big hair network, you know, Christian television or whatever, and, and to hear some of these people tell you that poverty is a sin and uh, if, you're, if you're, you're not doing health and wealth and you're not doing really well, then you're in some type of sin. If I heard others say if you've got some type of sickness, that's God's judgment in your life or sin in your life or anything that happens to you physically. Well, it's the same thing the disciples had went through. They said, hey, who, was, who sinned, this man or his, or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, that was their theology. That was their understanding. That obviously, and, and because, again, it goes all the way back. No one really wants to suffer, but, but you're looking for that blessed hope. False teachers, and again, those corrupt, just like Balaam, who intermingle and, and, and bring in all this false teaching. But so does the danger of allowing false teaching and immorality. That was the problem with the church there. Allowing that, holding on to that, bringing that in there. You know, it's, it's, it's not. I mean, again, you might cringe at this, but hate the sin, but love the sinner. And the best thing that I can tell you is, is that that is sin, and that's wrong. I, I love you, but, but this is wrong, and, I, and I'm not going to tolerate it. Then I'm against the world. When my family or, or anyone comes and, and they're shacked up, they're not living together, I'm like, hey, separate rooms. You can stay at my house with separate rooms. Well, we're, you know, we're together. What's the big deal? I don't watch it. I don't believe it. I don't do it. I don't want my kids to see it. I'm not going to condone it. No, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Not in my house. Under my roof. And if my rules are we hop on one foot and cluck like a chicken, my house, my rules, whatever. <laughs> you want to stay here? That's what you do. Sometimes I'd have the, the no, you don't do that. And I have it set up with my kids and they go into the house. Quark, 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 you know. And I've done that a couple of times there. The danger of allowing that to, to happen and to go into the family. Verse 17, the second part, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, understand when this is, what do you mean the hidden manna? John's getting this revelation. We've got the word of God. We've got it right here. We've got, I'm, I'm writing it, and there's already scripture out there. What do you mean this hidden manna? I understand that whole thing when you're going back, crack the code, that manna. Manna means what is it? When you go to Israel and, and with us and you hear people say, when, they ask, when, you, when you ask them a question, they'll go, ma? Ma? It means, huh? What? Manna, what is it? And I literally can go someplace and I go, manna. And they go, oh, that's a cup. That's this, the manna. The children of Israel, they, they get, were fed the bread from heaven. For that 38 years in the wilderness that they were there, they were fed the bread from heaven and they kept, what is it? It's manna. Well, now you're going to eat it. You're going to say, what is it? All day long. Manna cotti, manna waffles, manna bread, whatever. It's just manna. It's what is it? Manna, 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 manna. And so to him who overcomes, I will give that hidden manna, that bread of life. Well, when John's, why would it be hidden? Because now we see in this church age, for almost a, you know, a thousand years, the word of God was kept from the people. People like Wycliffe and Tyndale and others were persecuted and were burnt at the stake for translating the Bible into the common language of the day. And so here, 
it was going to be hidden. But again, when you're reading it, well, I don't understand. Why would it be written? But I understand this also, that this new stone, that was very prominent in the Roman thing. You were given a stone, and it was your admission there in Pergamos, and your name was on it. You as a citizen of Pergamos could go to the Colosseum. You could go anywhere with that stone. Hey, let me see your price of admission. Foreigners, anyone else didn't have that stone with their name on it? That was your, that was your permit. That was your pass there in Pergamos. And so he's using this local colloquialism to talk to them. He says, but you will have a new name which is written on it. No one accepts it. No one knows what it is except him who receives it. To him who overcomes. Overcome the spirit of accommodation and false teaching, and you will receive this hidden manna. You'll receive it. This accommodation, this alliance, this compromise, this being married to, that's what happened. That's what happened to the church. Gone from the persecuted church to being married now with the world. And they're attached to it. John 6, 41 talks about that true bread from heaven. You'll be given the word of God. And I will give him a white stone. The use of this white stone had many associations. It could be a ticket again to the banquet. Also, it could be that also, again, some interpreters or commentators talk about, you know, being blackballed. In other words, everyone pulls out a white stone. Well, you know, you reach in, but the one who gets the black ball, you're blackballed. That's how that whole tradition started. But you're given this new stone. And who knows it? It may be any one of these meanings here, but understand this. It has the assurance of a blessing. That's just all that stone means. You can squabble over what does it mean? Was that person blackballed? Was there a mission ticket or whatever? But what Jesus is trying to get across to you and I, you had this blessed assurance because that's what that stone represented there. And on that stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. What is the meaning of it? That secret name promised to? To whom overcomes? Is it God's name? Is it the believer's name? One idea behind this is the secret name. It shows that it's an intimate thing. Maybe you've been given a pet name. Sometimes, you know, you come here, like uh, Mike uh, Hansen. Do you even know Mike and Tanya's last name? It's Hansen. One of the things that Tanya says, you know, I don't want to be Tanya, the barber's wife, because we nickname Mike the barber. All right? Hey, Mike, who? Mike Hansen. Who? Mike the barber. The barber. That's just, oh, yeah, that's, you just get nicknamed for that. You know, we have two Alexes here. We have dark skin Alex and we have light skin Alex. I mean, you just, you just, you got the pet names. Well, there's an intimacy with that. We have an intimate name that we call one another here, Sinner. Uh, and sometimes people knew coming to the church like, hey, Sinner. Like, how do they know? How do you not know? <laughs> I take a little bit further. I call you a vomitous carnal flesh bag of pus. Try to interpret that, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> Another idea associated with the new name is simply that it's the assurance it gives us of our heavenly destination. Is your reservation made? Does your relationship with God make you sure that you will go to heaven when you die? That's what God wants to know. And you get that new name. It's always important to make sure that the faith alone that we have, that, that we hold on to, that's a faith that belongs to Jesus Christ. If you want to know if you're taking this, it's always important to make sure that it's faith. Second, not to lord it over. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Just go back a few pages from the book of Revelation there. <coughs> 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as, uh, as being lords over... The, uh, not as lords, being lords over those entrusted to you, but be, by being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you uh, be submissive uh, to one another and be clothed with humility. Well, this obviously, you'd have to hide the word of God from people. Because, again, the laity, the Nicolaitans, they were to be examples to the flock. And, and you see it sometimes here. The minister. The minister comes from the Greek word dekonai, which means servant. And, and Jesus Christ even said of himself, he says, I did not come to be ministered to, but to minister. And sometimes, here, here comes the minister. And people don't think that they're here to minister to the minister. That's what the name means. I'm a minister. Minister to me. 
And it just means, no, you're the chief example. You, you're, the, you're what the flock can look up to, but you're to lead them and you're to guide them. But the laity here, no, they began to sell prayers and indulgencies and certain, and certain sacrifices and various other things. And all of it was brought in and married into the church in that compromise for almost a thousand years before what we later we know, again, we'll get to in the weeks to come, the Great Reformation there. But you're not to lord it over. And here's the thing that I find in this younger generation, I'm talking under the 30 crowd, is that many of them want to be leaders, but they'll never be a follower. They want to be in charge, but they don't know what it is to lead somebody. I see that unfortunately, and hopefully, and I see that in some young military officers. They, they want to go into the military, and all they want to do is fun and games. And, I, and I'll talk to young military officers who've just graduated academies or whatever, and I say, what kind of leader are you going to be? Are you going to be someone your men can follow that you're going to lead in the battle, or is there any men there for you? You don't take from them. You don't take from them. And I've seen that even in my own military experience. Officers who were just the buddy buddies, and they got too much of the fraternizing, and they became best friends and all this kind of stuff, and they, be, they begin to take from you. You need leaders who will be able to lead, but they lead you in the paths of righteousness and show how to live that Christian life and to do those things, but you're not to lord it over them, and that's what the Nicolaitans were. Finally, a difficult environment never justifies compromise. Are you listening, Christian? A difficult environment never justifies compromise. Well, this uh, pertinent to this situation. When people are here say they're in a difficult situation, I give them Fox's Book of Martyrs. Does it match this? Does it match Antipas? Then Antipas is against the whole world. Will you stand and do for those things? It's easy for a church or a Christian in such difficulty to compromise in the name of, we need all the help we can get. But no church needs that kind of help. We can see here in God's Word that, that there's a a blessing that happens according to reading God's word. Understand and know the faith that you have in Christ Jesus and where your faith belongs and where you belong. And understand not to marry and, inter- and get intermingled. Not do those things. And I as a pastor, I've, I've been deceived. I've brought this church through some deception before and stuff like that. But it's once you recognize it, you're able to cut off and say, hey, we're not to do that anymore. We're not going to be a part of that. And there's sometimes where we can just be too tolerant when you have to call sin, sin. And that could be the best thing that you could do for somebody. Not like Dr. Robert Schuler, who writes in one of his books, I, I think the greatest damage that evangelicals have ever done in the body of Christ is to call someone a sinner. He's made a vow and a promise to never use that word. I was actually hearing on the radio years ago, one pastor proclaiming, you will never hear me use the word sin from this pulpit again, and the whole congregation is applauding. What would he call it, parfunkel? He said, well, uh, hey, you know what that is? That's... Uh, well, I can't use that word now. That might be maladaptive behavior. <laughs> no, it's adultery. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, well, you're really damaging your psyche and going against your positive self-mental image of yourself. I think you've been so open-minded, your brains have leaked out. It's sin. <laughs> and it misses the mark that God has for you and I. Why would I allow... It's like Corey. Corey, why do you got two black eyes, Corey? He goes, well, I'll tell you what happened. You know, Mrs. Jones, during worship, well, when she stood up, her pantyhose, her dress was stuck in her pantyhose. So I yanked the dress out. I didn't want her to be embarrassed. And she turned around and slugged me. Well, how'd you get the other black eye? Well, during one of the other songs, I thought she was so upset about it that I stuck her dress back in. (laughs) You understand this, folks. It's a joke. It's a joke. We can, and that's the whole thing when it comes to confrontation, we think more about ourselves than the person we're confronting. Will that person like me? Will that person do this? Will that, what will they think of me? Think more of that person, that what they're doing, once they find out. And think about your own walk. I, I've, I've walked with the Lord for about, you know, five years, and, and about the five and a half year mark of my walk with the Lord, and and being newly married and something, and then I was doing something, and then God just says, that, that's wrong, don't do that. I'm like, oh. my first thought was, well, I've, I've been doing this the whole time. And the conversation that I had in my heart and my mind was like, yeah, but now I'm telling you it's sin. And you don't go back and say, oh, man, I've been doing this all this long. But, but what did I do? I went back to all those other Christians. Hey, did you know this was wrong? Yeah, why did you say something? Instead of just humbling myself. 
trying to get the spotlight off of me. Hey, why didn't you say something to me? Well, I, I don't ever want anyone ever to come back to me and say, why didn't you say something? I want to be as the Apostle Paul says, I have not shunned to give you the whole counsel of God's word. I have not shunned to give you the whole counsel. The blood of no one is upon my head, upon my hands. And let us not shun to give everyone the whole counsel of God's word. And, and finally, I mean, you get through all this persecution, you get through all these things, and you, and you get to be, to be blessed. How do you get blessed? I couldn't resist. Here's my granddaughter. <laughs> I just love that, man. Yeah, I'll get him in now and then. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. And that God, that we can grow, that we can understand that, Lord, we don't have to intermingle. We can, don't have to get married to the things of this world. But, uh, Lord, that we can stay pure and we can stay separate and we can just rejoice in you. And that, God, that if there's any deception, there's any falsehood, if there's any corruption in our lives, Lord, then bring on the fire and bring the heat, bring the persecution and purify us, Lord. But, Jesus, may we not, as a church, ever walk and get married to the things of this world. May we just be married to one another, Lord. <coughs> And may we owe just everyone that debt of love. So we just praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.